Welcome to um, the wonderful Florence Nightingale Foundation webinars. I'm Lucy Brown. I'm the Director of Nursing with Wifi Leadership Development here at the Florence Nightingale Foundation. And I have the wonderful job of hosting these webinar series. We're absolutely delighted to welcome uh, Professor Vanessa um, Hislop and Dr. Natasha Phillips um, with a panel of fantastic experts on digital um, care. And it's really about how do we get nurses to be part of that conversation. Um, we've got a fantastic hour and a half um, set up for you, as I said, from a panel of experts who are going to introduce themselves as we go along. Just a reminder before we get started, we are recording the webinar. Um, so um, just to make aware of that, and you can share the recording with any colleagues that may have missed today. Um, so please do share and why we really want to make sure um, that this is shared um, across the nursing midwifery community to really, really raise awareness. Um, the focus of today, as I said, is on digital, how nursing midwives can really get part of that conversation. Now, as we're aware, digital technology and data science is really transforming healthcare. And really, silver lining of COVID and the pandemic is really, it was a catalyst for us to start operating more in that area. But what more can we do? Well, that's what we're going to hear from today, is from Natasha and Vanessa and the rest of the team about what we can do. And it's fantastic to welcome panellists from across um, Europe as well. So thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to hand across to Vanessa um, shortly, just to make you aware we will be taking questions. There is a Q&A function at the bottom of the screen, so pop your questions in there and I can ask them for you on your behalf. There'll be um, time for questions, about 15 minutes at the end of today's session. So thanks ever so much for joining us. I'm going to hand across to Vanessa. Thank you, Vanessa. Thanks, Lucy. It, it's so lovely to have you all joining us this morning. And, um, and as we go through the presentation, we'd really like to share our experiences of how we've worked together um, to influence policy. Um, and before we do that, we really want to get a sense um, and engage with you around your experiences um, of using policy. So if we can go to the next slide, please. So what we've got here is we've got um, an opportunity for you to engage with us via Mentimeter. So if you can either take out your mobiles and log into Mentimeter and use the number to log in, or you can use the QR code. And really, we wanted to get a sense from you, first of all, before we started our presentation, of your confidence um, around contributing to policy. And that could be policy at all levels. It can be policies within your local organisations. It can be a regional level. It can be a national level or indeed internationally. So what we'd like you to do is we'd like you to rate yourself, if you like, from a scale of naught to five. So zero being having no confidence in influencing policy and five feeling very confident. So you can go into Mentimeter and then put a number between naught and five. Um, we'll get a sense of, of what of where people see themselves um, and their confidence around influencing policy. So this is interesting, actually. It seems that we, what's quite lovely is we have a very broad range of people here. So some people feeling less confident and then actually some people feeling more confident to influence policy. And if we can go on to the next slide, um, Adam, um, it would be nice for you to really tell us a bit about what you think helps you to contribute to policy. So if you could type in some, some words around things that help you to influence and contribute to policy. There's some really lovely things um, coming here. So um, uh, somebody's put inclusion. That's an area that's very close to my personal heart. And um, I'm assuming from that you mean it's about ensuring that everybody feels included within that. It is about actually recognising the knowledge that we have as nurses and midwives and how we can use that knowledge through either our experience of clinical practice, um, our experience of understanding the systems in which we work, um, but also our experience of research research and how research can um, inform um, our clinical practice and help us feel much more confident um, around engaging with policy. So thank you. And Adam, next slide. 
And then our last question really is, is what you think hinders your contribution to policy? Wait for some of those to come through. And interesting, some of the things coming through here is around um, confidence. It's around the, the networking. So those opportunities through the people that you know. Um, and actually, we're going to share some of the examples of how we've got through some of those barriers um, through the project that we've been doing. Um, uh, never ending meetings. I think that links in with, with time. Um, and actually, maybe um, with, you know, the mention there around top down leadership and medical models around feeling that do you have a place at the table? Um, do nurses have a place at the table? And if so, how do we make sure that we use that place effectively um, to influence change? So if we can go on to the next slide, uh, please, Adam. What I'd like to do is to introduce some of my colleagues. Um, so you can see the full breadth that we have. Um, so as Lucy noted, uh, my name's uh, uh, Vanessa Heasley. I'm a professor um, of nursing and healthcare equity um, at the University of Salford. Um, my particular areas of expertise and interest are around inclusion, and it's about how we enable everybody to be able to access health and social care, especially those who find themselves typically on the margins um, of society. And I'm really passionate around uh, universal health coverage and about health for all. So I'm going to pass myself over to Gillian, who's going to introduce herself. Morning everyone, so I'm Gillian James, I'm a nurse academic at Manchester Metropolitan University in England and I, my specialty is around healthcare quality and safety improvement and workforce development and I'm very pleased to be here and um, engaging with you all this morning and I'll pass over to Michael. Good morning everybody, um, my name is Michael Shannon, greetings from Ireland. Um, I'm proprietor of a company called Global Leadership Consultancy, where we provide international consultancy on leadership to healthcare organizations and educational departments. I'm also a professor of nursing and, um, and health policy. And uh, just so you know, which I think is really important, I work one night a week as a, as a clinical nurse in palliative care. Thank you. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Natasha Phillips. I'm Chief Nursing Information Officer for England. So uh, in my day job, I am responsible for ensuring all nurses and midwives in England are enabled to work well in digital health and social care um, and that they're served well by digital technologies and data science. And I'm gonna hand over to my colleague, Joanne. Good morning, everyone. It's lovely to be here with you. My name is Joanne Reid. I work in the School of Nursing and Midwifery at Queen's University in Belfast. I'm a professor of cancer and palliative care. Um, my background, I've developed, designed, implemented and evaluated complex healthcare interventions del delivered on a digital format through various research projects that I've led. I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Bente. Hello from Norway. Uh, we are two Norwegians in this group, uh, Rolf Andre, which you can see uh, uh, the photo of. And he got ill today, unfortunately. But Rolf Andre Oxholm, he's a specialized nurse in intensive care and in care for the elderly. Uh, Rolf Andre is a board member in the Norwegian Nurses Organization and an executive workers union representative for the Norwegian nurses organization in Oslo University Hospital and the Regional Healthcare Trust of Southern Eastern Norway. And I'm Bente Lydman. I'm a director of nursing and health politics in the Norwegian Nurses Organization. I'm a nurse anesthetist and hold a master's degree in uh, public health. And I've been uh, a leader at, at hospitals for over 20 years. So my uh, special interest is in leadership and how digital care can be implemented in a very good way. So we really help nurses and midwives to use these tools. Thank you. And uh, Jao, now it's your turn. 
Thank you, Bente. Hi, my name is Jorge Gentil. I am a registered specialist nurse in family and community nursing and in public health from Portugal. Uh, I am also a certified global nurse consultant specialized in nursing administration. I have uh, several diplomas in health administration and I graduated in nursing information systems from Porto Nursing School. Uh, my recent research published are in digital health and in the nursing information systems uh, domain. Thank you. Adam, can we move on to the next slide, please? Okay, thank you, Adam. And um, we are the ICN uh, Global Nursing Leadership Scholars, uh, which is a competitive nursing leadership program that focuses on developing nurses' political skills. Uh, this acclaimed Global Nursing Leadership Institute, the GNL GNLI, uh, is a strategic policy leadership program focused on strengthening political and policy understanding and influences for nurses and midwives. Our group, as part of this uh, year-long program, had the opportunity to work with the WHO, and we want to use these skills in activities to improve health outcomes. Along our way, this year, we had the honor to be guided by Dr. Karen Bioro, who was our outstanding facilitator for Euro Regional Group. Dr. Karen Bioro supports was fundamental to our success across a long year program and also help us to be aware of how important was the collection of different skills inside our group. So I give now the, the floor to my colleague, Natasha. Xiao, thank you ever so much. Bear with me while I just turn my camera on people so you can see who's speaking. Hello again. Right, so uh, if we could go to the next slide, please please, Adam. Um, I'm going to talk a bit more about um, how we came to do the policy work um, that we have been collectively involved in. So um, I think what was interesting when we came together as a group of scholars um, through this programme was um, a real realisation that our expertise in the Euro region group spanned all clinical areas of practice, from primary care through palliative care through intensive care, so quite a breadth of, of clinical practice, but also academia, um, uh, working with as leaders in professional bodies, national leadership roles, and even independent nurse advisory roles. So what a great collective of people to come together and what a wealth of knowledge and experience we had. As part of the programme, we had to undertake a project together, a European project. And really, I guess that was to enable us to learn about policy development and have a vehicle for our learning individually and collectively, but also to impact change by informing policy at global level. So really supporting the ICN in their endeavours as a global nursing voice by bringing our expertise and, and bringing um, an ability to do pieces of work on behalf of the ICN. Um, we were provided with a number of suggested topics from both Karen and Maggie Langins, who's the Nursing and Midwifery Policy Advisor at the WHO Regional Office for Europe. So they had some ideas on what they thought were the key um, issues that we should focus on. And we, we explored those and, and, and what we really recognised was that common to all of our countries um, where we work, there was an expansion in digital healthcare. So this felt like a really important thing to pay attention to. You know, we were just uh, coming out of pandemic as we started this course, and we could really see that global explosion of digital, um, and yet a lack of policy guidance for nurses and midwives on an international perspective. So it seemed like a fruitful area to do something together. We also had another dawning realisation, um, and that was that we had more digital expertise, expertise between us than we had at first recognised. You know, so there was a lot of, oh, I, I'm not digital, I'm, I'm palliative care, or, you know, actually, I don't do digital, I'm all about inclusion. Um, and what we realised, actually, was uh, digital touches all of this. And people actually started to recognise that, that there were some areas where they were, um, as well as working on their specific interests, like inclusion, were working in some way towards what that what the implications were for digital so we started to sort of unite around this as an opportunity and I have to say as CNIO for England 
I was really excited to work with such a variety of experts. I saw this as a real opportunity to inform our national policy as well as global policy. And I really, um, I really felt that as we'd had that realization about our collective expertise, that, that resonated with, with our national approach here where we say digital is every nurse's business. So we started to think a bit deeper about, so what, where could we influence? We know digital is the topic, but what are we going to do? Could we go to the next slide, please, Adam? Thank you very much. Um, so we began to look at two key strategy documents, which are illustrated here on the, on the slide for you. The first one on the left is the Nursing and Midwifery Global Strategy. And that has a focus on four um, policy priority areas workforce, education, service delivery and leadership. And really it's intended to be used by member states to support the professions in these key priority areas where having gathered evidence across, across uh, the, the globe from nurse and midwifery leaders, we've said we really have some big challenges in, in relation to our workforce of the future. Uh, we need to do uh, more around education. Uh, pointing to the changes in service delivery and how much a strong leadership voice is required. And that leadership voice is very variable depending which member state you're in. Um, we're fortunate enough here in England um, to have a very strong professional leadership voice with influence at a policy level, but that isn't the same everywhere. And if we work together, how can we support those countries where they may not have that voice was uppermost in our mind. We also started to look at the global digital health strategy, and that calls our attention to the opportunities that digital presents to tackle those global challenges of workforce, of service delivery, um, and, and delivering those sustainable development goals. Um, in particular, the goals for healthy populations. So how could we bring these documents together and do something where nursing, which has at its heart a, a desire to support healthy populations, how could we bring them together and add something new to our collective work to make sure uh, that, that policy was supporting practice in this area? And we noticed that there were dependencies between the two and the policy couldn't be delivered without paying attention to one without, without one paying attention to the other. In this way, I think we came to the decision that we had a unique contribution that we could make to policy. And our project was to, to clo work closely with the International Council of Nursing and the World Health Organization to inform further policies on digital healthcare, ensuring that nurses and midwives are heard and their needs met through this policy development work. And we had the opportunity to work with both teams at the World Health Organization to advance that. So if we can go to the next slide, I just want to focus a little more on that global digital strategy. So what we learned was the Euro region had decided that they would have a roadmap to support the delivery of that strategy. So this felt like a real opportunity and we started to deconstruct that road, roadmap. We met with the WHO Euro region digital and data and the nursing and midwifery policy teams to start to think about this a bit more deeply. And the image that you can see here shows those four key priority areas. And what we also have called out in this image is that nursing and midwifery input is needed across all of those. So we really debated the role nurses had to play amongst ourselves and with these policy leaders. And it was a really fruitful conversation where there was acceptance that nurses and midwives have a key role in the delivery of this roadmap and are also key benefactors of successful implementation. So we were on our way, we had a project we were going to do something with policy. And what I'd like to do now is to hand over to my colleague. If we can go to the next slide, Adam. Thank you ever so much. And I'm going to hand over to Benta, who's just going to take help us to take a moment to reflect on why, why you think it's important that we have a policy voice. Over to you, Benta. Thank you, Natasha. We go to Mentimeter again. And we want you to reflect on why do you think it is important that nurses and midwives contribute to policies on digital health care? So if you can just put in a, um, a digit for this question. Uh -huh. 
or short answers in yeah and now we will get this word cloud thank you and we can all agree on that we are the largest workforce and therefore our voice is very important so that the service delivery is a good one we belong to the front lines uh, and that's for the whole uh, um, whole week and whole, all of the year 24 7. the process can become to it or commercial without us and enables the value of nursing outcomes of care. This is very familiar to what we have discussed when we uh, have do, done our project. I think we can move on to the next slide, please. This is our Eurogroup uh, doing a workshop for a few days in Copenhagen in April this year. And it was quite a busy, busy workshop, in fact. Uh, friendly hosted by the WHO Euro Regional Office in Copenhagen. And we were able to uh, get good advices from the WHO and to finish our project, in fact. And as Natasha mentioned, Maggie Langins, uh, the nursing and midwifery policy advisor to the regional office. She's standing in uh, the first line down uh, in the right corner. And we also have Clayton Hamilton uh, in the middle of the uh, photo, who's a um, regional technical officer for data and digital health. And these were very helpful for us to discuss with, and they really enabled us to progress in our uh, project. And then I'll hand over to Gillian, uh, no, sorry, to Joanne. And the next slide, please. Thanks so much, Benta. So as Benta has just mentioned, um, as GNLI scholars, we undertook a two-day workshop, um, which was hosted by the World Health Organization in Copenhagen. And it was really um, from working together with them that we developed a conceptual framework focusing on the role of nursing and midwifery in the digital space. And that's what you can see on the screen presented uh, in front of you. So central to this conceptual framework, to this representation that we have, and very much reflective of the core values of nursing and midwifery, right at the centre, we have citizens who through optimal digital engagement can be empowered to manage their health and wellbeing right across their life course. Whenever we were developing this conceptual framework, Natasha has already mentioned these documents, but what we really reflected on was the content of the WHO Global Strategic Directions for Nursing and Midwifery, which is a document that's running from 2021 up to 2025. And there are four uh, strategic directions and policy priorities within that that are around jobs, education, leadership and service delivery. And we mapped each of those um, into this diagram. What we wanted to do was identify aspects under each of those that we would plan to address in the policy framework that was developing. So nurses and midwives, as you can see um, from some of the results through Mentimeter, um, they're the largest profession, but they're also the most trusted profession. And therefore, they're, they're really well placed in order to garner trust in relation to digital health solutions that we can propose. But to do that, um, nurses and midwives need to be empowered, empowered to provide leadership, to not only be involved in, but to really drive digital healthcare innovation. And to do that, they need to be supported um, to actively engage in designing and implementing and evaluating and refining digital technologies. And that's really important because that means that systems are developed with nursing and midwifery input and that they're fit for purpose and that they address some of the current challenges that we face on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of digital systems, such as interoperability, for example. 
And it's really only through active involvement at all stages that, that nurses and midwives can optimally harness the potential benefits that digital healthcare um, can hope to provide. So you can see wrapped around the outside of this, then we have the ICN and the WHO, and they're really key bodies in terms of facilitating nurses and midwives to maximize the opportunities that can exist with digital healthcare. And that um, really focuses across two key areas. The first of those focuses on investing in nurses and midwives so that we, number one, have the necessary workforce, but as well as that, we need to ensure that that workforce is sufficiently prepared, they're sufficiently trained, not only to deliver, but to be active partners in all of the stages. Uh, so designing, evaluating, ongoing refinement of digital healthcare. The second very much goes, where, goes back to where we started within this diagram and it focuses on the citizens. And what we really want to ensure is that all citizens have equitable access to digital tools that are safe and that are effective to help support them in terms of health and well-being for all citizens within our societies. So um, this particular piece of work from this two day event then really informed an editorial which we're just in the process of finishing at the moment. Um, it's an editorial that's a collaborative piece of work between ourselves and our colleagues within the WHO and it's aimed at the Lancet Digital Health Journal. So we hope to have that submitted prior to Christmas. So Adam, if you could move on to the next slide, that would be super. So just to say that um, in thinking through the programme of work, as Natasha has explained, um, this originally started as our regional project, our GNLI regional project. But in thinking through that programme of work, we really have a collective ambition to inform and to shape policy within the digital healthcare space. And we've been focused in terms of our work to ensure that the WHO Regional Digital Health Action Plan, so that's the one that's running from 2023 up to 2030, is informed by and also considers the implications for, for nurses and midwives. So, and we want them to be seen as key contributors to the achievement of universal health coverage. And that very much aligns with the WHO Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, and in particular SDG 3, which is good health and well-being. And universal health coverage is one of the targets that sits in underneath SDG 3. And really, um, universal health coverage means that all citizens within our communities um, receive health services, a full spectrum of health services, uh, right from health promotion through to prevention, treatment, rehab, palliative care across their life course, which is very reflective of their needs as they move through life. And that that care is of a sufficient quality to be effective and that it's also ensuring that the use of those services does not incur any financial hardship. So we have a number of steps, a number of work packages that we hope will inform this. And I'm going to start these and then I'm going to hand over to Gillian, who's going to tell you about um, an additional one. But just to start us off, Adam, if we could move to the next slide, that would be super. So the first of um, these pieces of work in terms of time really aligned with the 72nd session of the World Health Organization Regional Committee for Europe. So that was held in September of this year uh, in Tel Aviv. And that was really important because that's where the World Health Organization Digital Action Plan for Europe, which is the document that's running 2023 to 2030, was being presented for adoption. And uh, as a group of GNLI scholars, what we wanted to do uh, was develop a statement of support for uh, this digital action plan on behalf of the International Council of Nurses. So we, we did that. That's, that's what we co-authored. And we're going to show you the video of that in just a few moments. And that was also then endorsed by EFNMA, the European Federation of Nursing, National Nursing and Midwifery Associations. So um, in terms of the statement, what, what we really wanted to focus on 
was recognising the synergy between the WHO strategy and digital health, which Natasha touched on, um, and also the WHO global strategic directions for nursing and midwifery document. And essentially what we wanted to outline was that one can't be delivered without the other. And importantly, what, what we wanted to call out were the challenges faced by nurses and midwives and also outline the necessity for nursing to be involved and not just involved, but to have a really strong leadership voice and a leadership role in terms of the implementation of the digital health action plan. So um, it was very proactive engagement uh, and it was based very much on collaborative working between ourselves as GNLI scholars but also our colleagues in ICN and our colleagues at WHO Euro, Maggie, Clayton, Maggie and Clayton in particular. And we really seen this as the first step in terms of impacting policy within this place. So I'm going to hand over to Adam, who uh, is going to play the actual statement for you. Council of Nurses and the European Forum of National Nurses and Midwives Association strongly support the proposed Regional Digital Health Action Plan and believe that digital technologies provide significant opportunities to improve the working lives of nurses and midwives, advance practice and improve population health. There is significant potential for nurses and midwives to be both positively impacted by and contribute to the WHO Digital Health Vision and Associated Regional Action Plan. Their contribution is vital for effective digital transformation. Without it, there's a risk that the accelerated adoption of digital health will have a negative impact on the ability of nurses and midwives to deliver care and support citizens' health and well-being. Nurses and midwives tell us that the challenges they face with digital health are Digital technologies are not well designed and cause more work for nurses and midwives, affecting their ability to join up care across different care settings and to deliver person-centred care that is safe and of high quality. Systems are not well connected and this lack of interoperability affects the ability to share information and creates duplicative work for nurses and midwives. They do not feel confident in sharing data and reassuring the public about data security. There's a lack of education at pre and post registration to enable them to work with technology and handle data to support care. Digital technologies often reinforce exclusion of staff, marginalised groups and communities. The pandemic has demonstrated the ability of nurses and midwives to adopt new ways of working with a surge in remote monitoring and telehealth. There is evidence that in some areas, nurses and midwives are already taking a leading role in digital healthcare. The ICN recognises the need to support levelling up the roadmap calls for in order to deliver the sustainable development goals. A number of member states are delivering profession specific initiatives and guidance to build capacity and capability. The ICN will collaborate with the WHO to ensure shared learning to deliver the best opportunities for citizens, midwives and nurses regardless of where they live. There is a synergy between the Regional Digital Health Action Plan and the WHO Global Nursing and Midwifery Strategic Priorities. The former cannot be delivered without the latter. Therefore, we call for nurses and midwives to have a leadership voice and role in the implementation of the action plan across member states. Thanks very much, Adam. And I'm going to hand on to Gillian. Hello again. So, next slide, please, Adam. Hello. So, the next, the next step or the next, next task that we're undertaking is to review the evidence base to inf inform a planned policy brief. We're using an integrative review methodology, uh, therefore, to synthesise information about the current nurse and midwifery contribution to lead in digital healthcare policy and practice alongside also looking at what facilitates and or hampers this contribution. Many of you may well be familiar with this type of methodology, but the main stages of the review are outlined on the slide. And we were very fortunate to secure funding to support this from the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland and the, ICE, the uh, International Council uh, of Nurses. Next slide, please. So this integrative review, as I've, I've said, 
um, aims to inform a policy brief. This slide summarises um, the purpose and format of a policy brief. As, as you can see on the slide, it's a concise standalone document on a particular issue that requires policy attention. And I can see in the comments that people on the call today have, have experience in policy development. Um, so this, I would guess this would be familiar to those people on the call. Any policy brief has to be evidence-based and developed with key stakeholders in order to provide a compelling justification alongside practical recommendations for change. In our case, the change relates to health policy and enhancing the role of nurses and midwif midwives in leading digital health care and digital transformation. The policy brief we are developing will be presented at the World Health Organization Regional Committee for Europe um, in the coming year, 2003. So our policy brief is at an international level, but the principles are the same, um, whether you're working at local, regional or national policy development level. And I'll pass over to Bente. Thank you, Gillian. Next slide, please, Adam. Uh, what have we learned from this program and project? Lucy very politely introduced us as uh, nurses with digital expertise, but I'm not sure we can say that we have that. In fact, we are nurses and we use digital tools because we need to do that and it's part of our jobs. And we were very fortunate because of our positions, we were able to attend the GNLI program, uh, which is held by the ICN. And we got in contact with the WHO uh, office, regional office in, for Europe in Copenhagen, which also put us in a position to influence those who are policy makers. And I think that's what we've learned from this, that we can unite also uh, across borders in Europe and uh, have this common voice to uh, really put on the agenda what is important for nurses so that our voice is heard and that we can uh, influence on what is going on on this field. So in that respect, you can say we are all digital uh, experts. And as you can see here from some of the some of the quotes from our group, it's been a real pleasure to work together in this way because we've we've all learned so much from each other, and we very respectfully has uh, given each other a lot of space and uh, developed our views we, uh, without uh, or within the process of this um, project. And then the next slide, please, Adam. And then we go to the Mentimeter again. What do you think are the benefits of working as the whole profession rather than just the digital specialist community? So if you please can type some things here so we get another word cloud. Absolutely, strength in experience. And that experience we need to uh, put in uh, the digital tools that we are developing. Multi-professional experience, good overview, collaboration, shared experience as also mentioned from our group. A lot of good, uh, of good views here. I hope you really can go back to your colleagues and discuss this and, and find a way to influence so that we really get good solutions in this field. 
if we go to the next slide, and then I would like you to come forward, Michael from Ireland. Thank you so much, Bente. And um, I'm going to start by reflecting on some of the policy hinders and uh, policy drivers that you've mentioned, because they're very pertinent to us and why we came together in partnership as a GNLI uh, scholars. It was interesting to note that uh, a number of you stated that your policy hinders uh, related to lack of networking, uh, poor research or no research, lack of clarity, lack of empowerment, um, maybe no confidence or minimal confidence, and uh, not having that ability or vehicle to uh, use your voice as an option. And in many ways for us as GNLI scholars, we can um, sympathize with those policy hinders. And in many ways, a lot of us felt that way before we came as scholars onto the GNLI program. So what the GNLI program uh, offered us, uh, and we really had to individually take a risk and collectively working together, take many risks, it gave us that vehicle to network and engage and show that we could contribute our voice, we could try and influence, we could network, and we could also ensure that we could think through best evidence practice and uh, research to influence digitalization and nursing and midwifery, but also to introduce and influence nursing and midwifery uh, policy worldwide. So I'm just going to read uh, some of these snapshots of takeaway messages from our colleagues that you have so eloquently heard from today in relation to our experiences of coming together as GNLI scholars and what this program has given to us. So my first um, statement here uh, is from Bente, who you've met from Norway. And she said that the GNLI program has really increased her knowledge about digital health, which comes in handy in her daily work as a director of nursing and health politics in the Norwegian Nursing Organization, also known as NNO. In the context of our colleague, Professor Vanessa Heesler from the United Kingdom, the program has given her opportunities to co-convene the GNLI Alumni Euro Network Group. She's been invited to the NHS England CNNO Research Advisory Panel about social determinants on health, which is the Chief Nursing Information Officers Group. Um, she is also the lead author, author on mental health, social inclusion and young people aged 18 to 29 which is paper two framing the solution space to building economies and well-being. In the context of our colleague, Professor Joanna Reid uh, from the United Kingdom, uh, based at Queen's University in Belfast, she has outlined that the program has given her opportunity to be a member of the World Health Organization European Regional Technical Expert, Palliative Care Nursing and Midwifery and their first meeting was in May 2022. Also to be a member of the World Health Organization Nursing and Midwifery Global Community of Practice. Our colleague Joe from Portugal has outlined that the program has given him an opportunity to develop networking and opportunities with Maggie Langens, who's the Nursing Policy Advisor at the World Health Organization. Um, in the context of supporting nursing and midwifery in Portugal and Europe, and also to be a member of the NHS England CNIO International Advisory Panel. Our colleague who can't be here today, Rolf from Norway, has outlined that the organisation and partnership of GNLI has given him an opportunity to network in Norway and with colleagues right across Europe to influence nursing and midwifery practices. 
Dr. Gillian James from the United Kingdom, who you've met earlier, has outlined that the GNLI programme has given her an opportunity to convene the GNLI Alumni Europe Network Group. She has had contact with Maggie Langans, the Nursing Policy Advisor at the World Health Organization, re potential links with the WHO Europe about us, Europe European Center of Excellence for Quality and Care and Patient Safety, which has taken place in Athens or through Athens in Greece. And also the member of the WHO Nursing and Midwifery Global Community of Practice. And you've heard from our colleague, Dr. Natasha Phillips from the United Kingdom, and the program has given her an opportunity to partner with meetings with Maggie Langans, who's the nursing policy advisor uh, from the WHO in the context of opportunity to support nursing and midwifery digitalization, which today we're saying is absolutely critical. Collaborative partnership with Mr. Clayton Hamilton, who is the lead for the WHO digitalization program, and Natasha referred and Gillian to our contact with uh, Clayton, who has been so helpful throughout our program in influencing nursing and midwifery voice in digitalization. And also an invitation to speak at the Global Health Connectors Partnership run by the European Connective Health Alliance. And in conclusion, in relation to myself, the uh, GNLI program has given me opportunity to co-chair a mental health European coalition uh, with Ms. Maggie Langans and Dr. Lidi Lazari from the WHO. And our first, uh, sorry, our second meeting is taking place in Ankara at the end of this month. Also, we secured funding to support a researcher, Dr. Anne-Marie Ryan, to help our group in the context of clarity in relation to digitalization and best evidence to support nursing and midwifery. And also I had the opportunity to have Elizabeth Iro, who is the chief nurse for the World Health Organization to be my mentor during the GNLI program. Adam, could we have the next slide, please? So, before I pass you over to Dr. Vanessa or Professor Vanessa, I'd be grateful if you could take a moment to reflect what do you think our future policy statement should focus on? And if you could uh, put your views, please, and kindly into the Menticom. Thank you, and we'll have a look at them. Thank you, Adam. So looking at a number of your views and advice, optimism, education, pre and post digital, digital preparedness, nurse education, inclusion, equal access for citizens and how we achieve this, data possibilities, developing leadership skills, inequalities and nurse education, all very, very important. And critically, we should focus on training and empowering frontline workers, which I certainly would concur with. So thank you so much. And I'm going to pass you over to Professor Vanessa. Thanks, Michael. I think it's really interesting. I've been reflecting whilst I've been here listening to my colleagues um, talking and thinking to the responses that you gave in Mentimeter. And, and I would say probably at the start of um, our GNLI programme, um, there was many of us that perhaps um, didn't feel uh, confident influencing uh, policy at an international level. Um, and, and I think um, focusing on uh, digital um, and, and the digital agenda has really opened our eyes to actually the expertise that we do hold as nurses in our diverse areas and how we bring those skills together um, to share and shape the agenda. 
And I think it's interesting um, if we think about um, the networks, and I noticed many of you um, had identified networks as a challenge in influencing policy. And I think from my, my own reflections that actually the more that I've put myself forward and engaged, the more it's expanded my network. So if I think about the work that I'm doing now with the WHO at Venice office um, around mental health and inclusion, um, would never have happened. Does that make sense if I hadn't started um, mm. to work with colleagues here um, around uh, digital and, and digital health? Um, and as we know that that many people who find themselves uh, excluded from healthcare potentially uh, could find themselves even more excluded um, from uh, uh, digital divides. And, and so I think it, it's about us thinking about as we're moving forward within each of your scope of practice to think actually how can you use your expertise and your experience um, in the organisations that you work or also perhaps at a regional or a, a national level uh, and I'm sure my um, colleague Natasha um, can uh, pick up later around um, the the digital champions there are that are working regionally um, and look at some of the possibilities to to share your expertise in your diverse diverse fields of practice to influence that agenda. And so before really we we share our contact details with you and go on to a, a more discursive Q&A, we're interested to see actually what are your what are your thoughts of the what we've presented today, the webinar um, and whether or not actually we've given you any pearls of wisdom and it's okay to say that we haven't um, and if there's anything perhaps that you would do differently. gone very quiet. There was a slight delay in the responses, but coming in now. <laughs> I, th I think I really like the take the leap actually, because I, I'm sure I, I speak on behalf of myself and probably many of my colleagues that actually um, working in a policy space does take a leap because it's different skill sets. So for, if I think about my own experience, I'm very used to writing papers, uh, but actually writing a policy brief is very different from writing an academic paper. Uh, and so sometimes it is about us as nurses taking a deep breath and just jumping out there. I think for me personally, it is about the areas that you're passionate about, which will drive that. Um, and so I think it is about looking for those opportunities um, when they come. Um, and I would say that the GNLI programme is a great programme, um, but there is also the Florence Nightingale Leadership Programme, which provides opportunities for people to to shape um, and to be bold um, and, and to try something different and to put themselves out there. So if we can go to the uh, last slide, uh, uh, please, which is just really our, our contact details. We welcome to for you to get in touch with us. Um, this is a start of a body of work. So whilst our GNLI program has finished, um, actually we're all very committed as GNLI scholars to continue working with each other. Um, and as Gillian identified in, in our webinar today, actually we're moving forward uh, with our integrity review um, and, and building upon this, um, and, and actually that's led to, to further opportunities to engage in this digital space. So I'm gonna hand back to, to Lucy, who's going to um, really start um, the question. So I don't know if my fellow panel members want to switch their videos back on. And I'll hand over to you, Lucy, to, to, ho to host the questions. Yeah, of course, thank you so much. And what a really interesting webinar. I feel really thrilled to be able to to welcome you all today and share your expertise. It's, it's fantastic, what an incredible group to come together through that GNLI scholarship. So we've got a few questions just to remind our people who've joined us today. Um, you can pop your questions in the Q&A section at the bottom. We've got a few to start with, but please feel free to add them and I can ask them on your behalf. So I think first, the first question we've got was asking around diversity. And I think Vanessa, you're gonna to help to answer that one around inclusivity. So we've got Caroline, um, the chair, I hope I've said your name correctly, Caroline. I'm just asking how inclusive of your team 
when it comes to policy contribution from other diverse teams and hearing from those minority groups as well. So Vanessa, I hope if you want to start the answer and then if any of your fellow panellists want to tip in, please do. Yeah, and I think it's a really important question because if we think about our workforce, nursing is not homogenous workforce or, or nurses and midwifery. Um, we're not homogenous. So, you know, we're talking about a variety of different ages, different genders, um, people with living with disability, people not living with disability, people from a variety of different um, ethnic minority groups. Uh, and I would say, actually, the GNLI programme itself is quite diverse. So it's a programme that's open for nurses um, across the country. So we're representing, if you like, a, a, the European group. Um, there is the Afro group. Uh, Natasha, please chip in with the other groups. I'm trying to remember all the other groups. There's the Asian Pacific groups. Yep. <laughs> but there is, and there's also an American group. Originally, when the programme was conceived, we, we all came together as one group. Um, in Geneva, which was a really exciting opportunity. Um, but with the pandemic, uh, we worked more in our regional groups. But I think what was great is there were periods when we worked as a real global community. And I sort of, uh, we all connected individually offline with some of those members, didn't we? Mm. And I found that really helpful. Um, I learned quite a lot from colleagues in the Afro region about things like, you know, how you, uh, how you deliver remote care um, in really creative ways using digital technology. So it is a really diverse programme. And I think, um, I mean, there's, if, if we think about the topic we're, we're tackling as well, digital, inclusion is such a fundamental part of it and the risk mm. of exclusion. Um, and so bringing our diverse opinions as professionals to it, but also the diverse voices of the people we serve is important, isn't it? And I guess that's some of the work we're doing in, in the integrative review and the way we're looking at gathering evidence to make sure that uh, we are hearing from as wide a community as possible. Hmm. Thanks, Natasha. Is it right that GNLI groups are aligned to the WHO regional regions? So I think each of the WHO regions had a, had a group. Yes, yeah, so was originally it was fantastic. one group. Now they're aligned uh, specifically to the region. So each region will do something like we have done. And there's an alumni. It's very like the Florence, Lucy. It's oh, a wonderful fantastic. opportunity. Um, really, you know, why did I choose it? Well, I wanted to learn the dark arts of policy making, as I call it. I felt I'd arrived in a national role and I now needed something that would help me learn about that. And I feel very lucky uh, to have to been able to join the programme. I would say the benefit, one of the key benefits, like Florence, is the network you make. I mean, look at this great array of people that I'm working yeah. with now. Um, so, yeah, it's an annual programme. It's definitely worth thinking about for some leaders who are thinking about how are they going to influence policy from, from all sorts of roles and backgrounds. Fantastic. And it's great to see that cross-pollination, isn't it, shared best practice. Be fantastic. Thank you. And you're obviously <laughs> a tribute to all of that with you, all of you here today. Uh, we've got another question, which is, um, around the um, Brexit and the implications of this and then the collaboration. Has there been any implications for the progress of any of your projects or is it enhanced? It? I don't know, just be interesting to see your views. I think, Michael, would you be happy to start the answer on this one if that's okay? Sure. Thank you, thank you. Lucy, and, and thank you to your participant for the question. Um, I suppose my initial reaction would be, you know, healthcare is complex. Policy is complex regardless where we work. And, but at the same time, what we all have in common is patient care and person-centered care. And we also have a con commonality of our professions, be it nursing, midwifery, or whatever, and the delivery of safe quality care. So taking those parameters in the context of Brexit, Yes, Brexit is there, but if you look at our group, we come from different parts of EU, be it Brexit or not Brexit, because we care about patients and person-centered care, and we care about our professions of nursing and midwifery. Um, I think your colleague, whoever made the comment, said, look for opportunities to contribute. And I think that's the answer to the question in many ways. Uh, be it GNLI for us or other networks such as your own agency, Lucy, or other international bodies. 
So I hope that has helped give some advice around that question. Maybe my colleagues may have other thoughts of, of wisdom as well. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Anything that any of the rest of the group like to add? And it was an anonymous question, actually, so if you've got anything you wanted to add to that, whoever that question came from, please feel free to add it to the, the Q&A. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Michael. Can, oh, perhaps perhaps, perhaps I could saying. just go fill, fill in from Norway. As uh, some of you may know, Norway is not a member of the e EU, uh, but we still have to work with all the organizations um, who are collaborating in the European Union. So uh, uh, without having any other opinion about it, 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 you are still a part of Europe, yeah. whether you're in or outside the EU, because you have to be that, yeah. I think we're Thank connected you. to our profession, aren't we, as Michael yeah. said, we're all there for the greater good and for our patients and, and there's something that people were looking after. Thank you, thanks, Penty. Okay, next we've got a question from Jerry Bolger. I'm um, just going to read it out, Jerry, so please do. I hope I articulate this well for you. So the issue of pre-education digital preparedness for nursing practice is key. And I think that came through the Mentimeter, didn't with all the responses there, education really bring primary focus. So considering that nurse education syllabi are managed differently at country levels, how can this group influence this as an urgency? And who would like so, to go? So I go to Gillian perhaps first, is that okay? Or Natasha, please feel free to... I'm going to Julian first and I come to you next, Natasha, if that's okay. Of course, absolutely. Um, great, well, as usual, great, great question and big challenge, I'd say. And it isn't just necessarily nurse education either. So in many, so for example, in, in the UK, England is, is different to many countries across the world in that we separate out nursing and, and midwifery education, whereas many other countries don't. I mean, I am aware of the, um, there was, so there was a global alliance for um, nurse education and science, and that has developed what, what are called the global pillars. Um, I think that was back in 2019. So what, what I can say is that work is ongoing. I think it's a big challenge. Um, in, in terms, and I suppose I come to this as an educator of many years as well, so just thinking about what we're saying about, I wouldn't see myself as a digital expert, but I do have expertise in curriculum development and influence and curriculum that I would br I bring to this group. And as we continue our work in this space, um, you know, education is a big part of the global strategic directions in, and in the conceptual framework that we talked about earlier on. So that will be being addressed. And I think that um, trying to support, if you like, and drive um, what's already been started with the global pillars. Um, there are lots of other issues, aren't there, around migration and where we recruit our nurses for, how, how we organise the workforce going forward. Mm. Um, are individual countries educating enough? Um, there's a lot of politics involved, and I think I'll go back to Michael's thing about it's very complex, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't be, be addressing it. Um, I suppose there are three... There are three main things I think that are particularly important that, that I know are being looked at and trying to, people are trying to get some kind of um, standardization or um, across the world. So particularly thinking about what are the, the, the outcomes of, of education, if you like graduate outcomes of, of nurses as, as they um, qualify. Um, educational the standards of the educational programs themselves and then a third one is the standards of the educational institutions themselves and so it's all around all the governance and mm. harmonization if i can say say that word um around those three things i don't know if that um answers the question because all of those things need to be within to, um you know, promote making sure that education is locally relevant, um, um, reflects best practice, but is also adaptive to the the relevant, you know, the social cultural context um, that the nurses are working in. 
Thanks, Gillian. Thank you. <laughs> a tough question to answer. Some great, it's, great responses there. It's great. Uh, oh, could I build? Oh, then I'm going to go Lizzie, to Natasha next. So if I, to add. <laughs> could I build on that answer? Thank you very much. And, and I think Gillian has answered that beautifully and very comprehensively thinking about this in the round and really talk, you know, bring it back to this is about more than digital this is a mainstream education piece the way we practice our nursing is fundamentally shifting and so therefore what we what do we do um and i uh jerry thank you brilliant question um i think you call attention to a really important bit which is why we've come together as a community which is nurses across a midwife across the globe are having quite a different experience and we know that there are exempt you know exemplars there are areas where they're further ahead in terms of thinking about how to prepare nurses and midwives to work in digital healthcare. Um, and then there are others where less far ahead. We know there are areas and countries where they are much more digitally mature than others. So quite a different, difficult circle to, to close, if you like. But I think the important thing is that we've started the conversation with the ICN and the World Health Organization, and it's our continued work with them that will inform this. So although on a national stage, we're doing a, a review, the Phillips Eyes Review, to look at exactly this question and actually have brought a global perspective to that. So, so each panel in that has a, a international and national chair and arguably the findings of that may feed into the work of the ICN and WHO because much of it will be relevant across the globe but I think the bridge of us having the commitment of the World Health Organization who are really keen to work with us and hear our voice and the International Council of Nursing saying actually we don't think we've given this enough attention and we really you know please please bring people together to help us solve this is a real opportunity for the whole profession and we're really committed as a group to continue to keep taking that forward but would love to connect with others who'd like to be part of our work so um, I know there was a slide at the end with our email addresses I'm sure you might be sharing the details welcome people reaching out to us Natasha, that's fantastic and absolutely you are the, the pillar heads that will take this forward and it's it's a really great question thank you Jerry and great answers from Gillian and Natasha there you know awareness is key isn't it it's first stage and that's what we're doing here today so we've got another question follow-up question really around influencing nurse education that's from Marion White who's um, got some small scale local funding to develop some immersive technology how can she use this to influence nurse education so I might come back to you Natasha if that's okay or any Oh, <laughs> um, now, and, and I'm not the educator expert in our group, so I'm sure there are many far more qualified people to do that. I, I'm really excited that she has that opportunity um, because I do think if we look at our national in England, again, our blended learning programs, what we're seeing is by bringing this technology into the education space by default that is preparing people. I think if I were her, I'd then be thinking about what are our particular local challenges? What do we want our people to know? And build it in that way. And, and um, I would urge her to write up her work, share yeah. it widely, <laughs> as, uh, that's the way we all in big and small ways contribute to the collective learning. So don't just do the work, which is what nurses are really bad at, <laughs> just doing the work, you know, because we're so busy and we go on to the next thing, but actually we need to we need to capture the learning, codify it in writing and share it with other people. I wonder if there are others who are much more qualified educators who might like to add anything to those thoughts. Thanks, Natasha. I might go to Joe actually, Joe, you haven't heard from either. Is there anything you'd like to add? Um, I think if I may just Michael. add on yeah, to that, and, and obviously I, I'm thinking it from it's the similarities, but projects that are happening in, in Ireland, um, if there's something local, it may be opportunity to see does that transcend or, or link to a national policy initiative. And then taking that leap and that risk to meet with those policy makers and say, look, I have an idea, I have ground funding here or seed funding, can you help me along that journey? This will impact patient care nationally and the profession. So it's just that opportunity to, to, to take that risk and think uh, maybe nationally. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. I think Gillian's popped her hand up now as well to contribute. Thanks. Well, I, I, I think they were great answers. So hopefully we're giving you a few options to think about. But just even just starting locally, I'd talk to your local university, local educators. You will have... Um, in England, it's Health Education England. There are there will be a regional lead for nursing and midwifery education. You could talk to them. You might 
get some support for an um to try to try it out or to try something out locally that will then help you engage with the the wider audience that Michael and Natasha were talking about as well. So I, I fully support what they've already said. It's not an either or. It's probably <laughs> do, do it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Gillian. And I think just on that note as well, as kind of uh, Natasha did uh, uh, make me think about this, is our digital scholarships for uh, those nurses and midwives working in England and Wales are open at the moment. They close on the second of December. So perhaps that's something to think about. And that's for Donna as well, Donna North, if you're based within the UK, something to bear in mind. Um, we also got global scholarships that will be opening up very shortly. So keep your eyes good, and I can share some links with that in the follow up email. So just something to think about that power of the networking and getting those skills to really make sure that influence and impact with these amazing large scale digital transformation projects and small scale projects as well in this technology. So fantastic. And Vanessa, I might come to you next. I've got yeah. your hand up. <laughs> So I'm just going to add, Lucy, sometimes I think um, you've got to be in it to win it. Does that make sense? So these opportunities mm. come up and you see them advertised and, and often you read about them and you think perhaps they're not for me, perhaps they're for somebody else. And, and I would mm. say, why not for you? Why should you not apply? And and so um, that get, that goes back to somebody made a comment early in one of the um, mentor meetings about being bold. So mm. I would say absolutely. When Lucy shares those links, either for the digital scholars or the global scholars, um, then you know book some time out in your diary to seriously consider that because we wouldn't have met each other if we all individually hadn't applied um, for the GNLI scholar. And I think there's definitely something around a power of coming together, of working with other nurses who are also passionate about an area. And that really um, supports you because we all have periods and we found this as a group we all have periods where suddenly somebody's really big busy and so they've gone a little bit quiet in the group and then they come back you know as things settle down and so there's that there's that collective support um around uh keeping together and keeping each other going um around the challenges and, and I would say more than that we've become actually quite good friends um I think really and got to know each other quite well uh, and so I would say to people when you do share that be bold and go for it mm. brilliant Vanessa it's about putting your head above the power of it isn't it and actually going for it and that power of the network you're certainly testament to some is greater than its parts that ripple effect you must all be creating in your respective areas is, is enormous it's great to have you all today so we've got some question, a couple of questions from Nicola, actually. It's great that you've answered a couple of questions. So it was on um, a follow-up question really to the inclusive, inclusivity question about um, how can you engage with people from a learning and intellectual disability? So, Vanessa, I think, would you be best placed to kind of answer that initially? And then, please, other panellists, please do chip in as well. Yeah, and, and I'm so pleased you've raised this, Nicola. And, and to be honest, my worry is if we don't have people championing um, let's consider digital with the whole gambit of inclusivity does that make sense the full diversity my worry is is it won't engage um and that's why really that's the bit i champion on and i go to meetings all the time and i'm talking about inclusivity and i'm talking about and i make no apologies for it because otherwise i'm frightened that people will get left behind and we know that for example if we look at people with um, a learning disability health outcomes are worse and so if we're not careful digitalization can further compound that and i think that's where we should use our voices as nurses to say stop we need to consider all groups so Absolutely. i'd love to say nicola i have the answer but i would be lying but i'm hoping mm. because you've raised this issue it's an issue that is important to you that you will also add your voice um, to the calling of a saying actually let's consider all groups yeah thanks for that and that allyship is so so important isn't it and using your privilege to open doors for others is, is mm. so so critical thank you um, next question is from Joe Alva. Um, and this is around leadership. Really, but how do you convince nurses to understand that small changes in that digital interactions and work can have a big impact on policy nationally? I think, Bente, you were happy to kind of start the question, the answer on this one. Might come to you first, but uh, I imagine Natasha may want to say a few words on this as well. Bente, I think perhaps Gillian uh, had an answer. Uh, your, uh, well, I can start. I think uh, your question is. It's very important, Joelva, and uh, it's from my point of view, who's been in leadership for many years. It's a it's a big question for leaders. How do you how do you get to implement uh, new technology 
how do you get new technology which which is able to solve the things that we want to solve and and uh, how do you get this uh, um, motivation within the nurse forces to use it because we are very good at the digital tools in our private life, most of us. But when it comes to using it uh, in at work, we have some hinders there. And uh, of course, it's it's also due to that they are not very uh, they are not very suitable. Uh, always. So, and it leads me to the next question from Nicola Braid as well. How do we influence and highlight the need for a national approach? And what is important is that we are able to share information. And we are not able to share information, not within the, the same system we work and not uh, across systems. And this is a big task. And in Norway, we are we are such a small population. We are smaller than London, uh, London town or city, and still we don't we don't manage this. And we we have so many systems not working together, not uh, talking to each other. So we are not able to share information, which uh, duplicate and triplicate uh, the nurses' um, uh, workload. In fact. But Gillian, you wanted to uh, answer Joel as well, and then Natasha can also answer a lot of these questions. Thank you. Thanks. I think Michael had his hand up. Michael. Yeah, yeah I'll get, I'll get, we'll come to Michael, I'll come to you next, Gillian. Oh, okay. okay. So, so Michael, so, you wanted to... Oh, go, go ahead, Gillian. Well, no, go, go Michael. <laughs> Sorry, I, I, am I going? <laughs> Thanks, Jill. <laughs> please, uh, it's, please, it's just please. really a comment as well. I, I Personally, who... I suppose I've been a nurse for a long time in many roles. I think the answer to this is in clinical leadership. And I think we have to define leadership. And mm -hmm. within that imperative, clinical leadership is, I think, the solution with the enablers of the policymakers and the experts, et cetera, et cetera. That came very clear in the context of the feedback of having a voice, clinical knowledge, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So I just want to highlight the importance of enabling clinical leadership to mm. Uh, mm. flourish in this. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. It is absolutely critical, and uh, thank you so much for adding that really important comment. Um, Gillian, over to you. So, well, I'd absolutely reiterate that. Um, I suppose uh, the, the question for me, I was thinking, I, I would be listening to those. So, so there's a very specific initiative that people may or may not be aware of called 15 Seconds, 30 Minutes. And I, I can find the link for you if you want. So I'd, I'd look at that and look at examples. And they're examples of ideas that people have had that if they spend 15 seconds on, it can save a colleague or a patient, somebody, mm. 30 minutes. So... It, um, mm. So I, I, I can share that with you. So great. things like that linked to what I was going to say was I'd, I'd show them, you know, show them how it how it does make that link to it can influence. I mean, that's now a national gone international initiative, for example. Um, mm. And that's linked to leadership, isn't it? And clinical leadership be, be role model. So make those small changes yourself. Let let people see you being um feeling the fear and doing it anyway, if you like, um, <laughs> and, and listen to the people um, that are in those situations. What, what, what is it? it I suppose I, I was going to come in just to say there is there is transferable knowledge here. So I'm more from a quality, a general quality improvement background, um, change background, you know, leading change. And there are transferable principles. So what is it that would focus your efforts on, on what is it would help those members of staff or people using services? Mm. Um, what I used to call it what's in it for me, you know, it, in a very positive way. But mm. that can help if, if you're helping someone to address an issue for them or their patients, then that is going to help to con and then show them how they can use that through networking, through connecting with others with similar ideas or a, a similar interest, then that will enable them to, um, to see the influence, if you like. I can definitely say until I applied for this programme, I never, 
I never thought for a minute I would be doing some of the things I'm doing or working with the people that I'm doing. So I, I have to reiterate that thing of, you know, feel the fear, put yourself out there. You're probably a lot better at this than you think you are. Um, and, we, and we do put a lot of, um, we, we ask a lot of ourselves and often that is more actually than, than other people um, would ask of us. Um, so so I'd, I'd encourage you to put yourself out there, I suppose, and help other people to do the same. Mm. Um, Thank you so much, Gillian. I love that. Feel the fear, but do it anyway. I love that. Thank you. I think that's the mantra for them today. Okay, we've got time for one more question. Give us loads of questions. It's absolutely fantastic to see the engagement from today. So it's really, I'm going to come to you down now, if that's okay. And a bit quiet, so we come to you on the interoperability. So really about using telehealth and the use of systems. How can we actually make sure we're you know, working with multiple trusts with different systems is a real issue. What can we do to kind of tackle this, Jazz? Would, gonna... would you like me to pick that one up, Lucy? <laughs> Yes. Yeah, that's um, okay. That's okay. So interoperability uh, is a big issue, and it ties into Nicola's question earlier about what are we doing nationally versus what do we do locally. And the reality is, we need to work at all levels of the system. So we've all got our part to play. Um, in terms of, um, and I'll speak to the English audience. I, do, I I can only speak for England at the moment, so I don't I don't know about other countries' perspectives, but. Um, you know, we our, our national policy is to go through, um, go via a route which is called convergence, essentially. So, you know, fewer digital systems, but not one monolith. Uh, we mm -hmm. had a national programme. We saw how that went. Um, but really, um, convergence. So, so as we work in our new landscape at ICS level, trying to get more people on the same systems, the principles of good, why why would we do digital? It's to join up care, isn't it? Um, mm. It's to reduce the burden on nurses and midwives. It's to make things safer. And that all requires interoperability, which just means working together and allowing information to flow. And it will require people, process and tech. So we have to tackle all three of those things, both at a national and a local level. So what could people here do that would, would help with that? One of the national things we've chosen to do as a professional is say we need a standardized approach to nursing mm. documentation. Zhao yeah. would tell you that in Portugal they have one record, they have a standardized approach and we're learning loads from him about the nursing ontology that they're working with which really means that you can deeply capture and codify information so it can travel for care but also for research purposes. We've got to start at a lower place and that means having a standard for nursing documentation that we develop into what we call an information standards notice um, so that we can give it to our vendors and say, this is what you need to install. Mm. I have a role to play in that. Others have a role to play in that. It takes time. But one of the first things is achieving that standard locally. So getting together locally and saying, do we all understand the same things when we talk about mm. fault? How do we want to document our care? How do we want to re represent the nursing care in, in our systems, be they on paper or digital? And we do have a national guidance coming out. It's just mm. going through comms approvals at NHS England, which is a rather painful process. Um, but hopefully it will come out at the end of the month, which would be a first step. So a simple takeaway from today would be look out for that, pick it up and think about what you can, can do with it. Um, in big and small ways. This is a really massive agenda, can seem quite terrifying, but there's a small contribution that all of us can make. And I think the first is just speaking to other people, which is the point of today. Mm. Thanks, Natasha, so much. It's great work going at the professional record standards body as well. You've been working with Natasha at PRSB within the yes, they're fantastic. standardising. Yeah, so just if people are interested, perhaps it's worth looking them up as well. Anything that any of the panel members wanted to end? Because sadly, that's our last question for today. We've got to wrap up. Not, no problems at all if there's nothing else. But I guess an enormous thank you to each and every one of you for taking time out of your busy schedule to come and share your knowledge and expertise and really raise the awareness on the digital agenda. It's so, so important. I think the key takeaways for me has been writing away and I'm really learning a lot is all nurses and midwives are digital. We all have a part to play, whether on the front line, providing patient care, whether we've got infants over, right up until we've got infants over international or national policy, we really have to all get involved. And I suppose it's back to that earlier point. I think each, every one of the panel members has made you would be bold, put your head above the parapet, feel the fear. I think, Gillian, I'm going to take that one away from today <laughs> and get involved. Digital is everyone's business. I think Tasha made that really, really important point. 
we've got to get involved. We are the largest workforce. We can have the largest impact. We're the most trusted workforce. We can really have an impact on patient outcomes as well as a result of all of this fantastic work. And that's why we're all here, really, isn't it? So let's get involved. Let's not call us, I'm not digital. We're very much all part of that agenda. So let's get involved. Just a quick pitch from me that we have, I know I said it earlier, but our digital scholarships are open at the moment for nurses and midwives working in England and Wales. They close on the 2nd of December. We've got one of our alumni here, Natasha, <laughs> who's actually very much involved as well, um, and that they are life-changing. And actually, we talked about that clinical leadership piece. Um, I've been a previous scholar, many others have. It really is how you raise your voice, be bold, put your head above the parapet, get involved, raise your awareness. It's a fantastic programme, so please, please do apply and we'll share the links to the applications. We've also, hot the press, got some global scholarships for senior um, leaders um, open um, at the FNF, so please do um, keep your eyes out for the, um, the communications around that. I'll share that on the back of this webinar as well. So please, please do get involved, and that's really getting involved in that agenda as well, raising our impact, having that strong leadership voice and the power of the network. Goodness me, the ripple effect from today and beyond is going to be phenomenal, so please, please do get involved. Thank you all. Sadly, we've run out of time. Um, it has been recorded. Share it far and wide with your colleagues. Um, please, we want to raise this awareness and, and hopefully we'll have a follow-up webinar as well. I'll just I'll put that out there, plug it so that these wonderful panellists perhaps we can have a follow-up to in the future. That'd be great. Thank you all. Have a great rest of the day and um, see you all soon. Thank you. Thanks, bye all. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.